Hello, and welcome to Into the Abyss podcast. This is a follow-up on a previous episode on the soul. In part one, I talked about the transporter problem as a way of getting into the topic of the nature of the soul. And this is part two of that series. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the soul as matter and form. So in the previous episode, I made a little taxonomy of different ways of understanding the soul as uh, material or formal. And then at the conclusion, I said that another way of looking at this is that it's not material or formal, but that it could be a combination of both. And I mentioned that this was an idea going back to Aristotle. So in Aristotle's thought, all things are a complex of matter and form. And so this is a view that's referred to as hylomorphism. And so that comes from the Greek uh, for matter, hule, and form, morphe. And this is something that applies to all things, not just living things. Everything has both material and form uh, going into it. But it also applies to soul, suche. And recall that this concept of suche in Aristotle's thought and in Greek thought is broader than the uh, uh, strictly supernatural notion of the soul. It's uh, more encompassing of the entire concept of the organism. This word suhe is the basis of our word in English for psychology. So one of the most important texts where Aristotle talks about this is his work on the soul in Greek. That's perisuches, also known by its Latin title, uh, de anima. And so I'm going to share some quotes from that to get into the specifics of his theory. And in the first of these, um, I'd uh, like to read an analogy that he gives that I think illustrates really well the um, intrinsic uh, composite nature of matter and form in the soul to help us start to think of these as two aspects of one thing. And one of the nice things about the Greek is that there are a lot of cognates, and uh, even though the cognates aren't exactly equivalent to the English versions of them, I, I think it is nice to uh, at least be exposed to them and start thinking about them so that we might start thinking about the words that we use in a slightly different way. So, um, of course, uh, I'll, I'll read one passage in Greek just for fun because I think it's kind of neat to hear this voice speaking from the dead, the, uh, the words that Aristotle used. Um, but uh, the rest I'll use in translation, but I'll, I'll pick out some of the Greek words um, here and there because I, I think it's, uh, it's nice to appreciate uh, some of those Greek terms. So this first passage I'm going to read, this is from On the Soul, Book 2, Chapter 1. And this is the only passage that I'll, I'll read in the Greek, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll read the rest in English just with the interspersed uh, Greek uh, key terms. So uh, here's the passage in Greek first. Diakai ude zetain e hen he suke kai tasoma. Hosper ude ton keron kai taskema. Ud halos tain he kastu hulen kai tahu he hule. So Aristotle's saying there, quote, That is why we can wholly dismiss as unnecessary the question whether the soul, suke, and the body, soma, are one. It is as meaningless as to ask whether the wax and the shape given to it by the stamp are one or generally the matter of a thing and that of which it is the matter." Close quote. So just like the stamp and the wax that uh, the impression is made in are, can be understood as one thing, uh, for Aristotle, the soul is, it's not, it, it's not that it's either matter or form, but intrinsically it's this complex of both of these aspects. And uh, there are various ways uh, that we can understand this uh, that I'll get into. But first, let's talk a little bit about the way form works in matter, especially in a living thing. And I think this is something that uh, Aristotle uh, brings to a strict uh, materialist uh, conception of biology. That uh, this is a little bit, um, a little bit more satisfactory, in my view. So uh, he uh, he talks about this idea of actuality. Um, and I think of it as kind of an animating principle. And it, it's, a, it's a question of what is it that brings matter to life? So um, in uh, organic chemistry, uh, we deal with the same type of uh, elements that are going into a living thing. But by and large, most of the things that we deal with in organic chemistry are not alive. So there's definitely some difference between just those chemicals and than the matter that goes into a living thing. Furthermore, uh, things that have been alive um, after their lifespan is over and they are no longer alive, there's definitely a difference there too. So um, 
this uh, this actuality. Uh, the an what's the animating principle that makes that difference? So here's another passage from On the Soul. Quote, The body will not be the soul, for the body is not an attribute of a subject. It stands rather for a subject of attributes, that is, matter. It must follow then that soul is substance in the sense that it is the form, ados, of a natural body having in it the capacity, duname, of life. Such substance is actuality. The soul, therefore, is the actuality, intelechea, of the body above described. Close quote. So let's unpack this a little bit. Three important concepts here. Uh, one is form, ados, um, one's capacity or potentiality, uh, duname, and then actuality, intelechea. And one way I like to think of this, and this is this is my uh, own uh, method of approaching this, is is to move conceptually uh, from chemistry to biochemistry to physiology. So what's happening when we do that is that we're taking raw materials and we're imposing organization onto it, and that's basically an imposition of form, ADOS. And as we do that, um, it's getting organized into not just organic uh, organic molecules, but uh, molecules that are able to do things and start to participate in processes, uh, biochemical processes, and then a larger a larger scale uh, physiological processes. So it, it, this, as this happens, um, there's increasing potentiality duname, and that this just slides upward onto a scale uh, toward actuality, where there starts to be a biological process, and then we start to get an organism. So we're moving from just body um, into process and motion uh, to the actualization of a living organism. And on the subject of organization, I think of one of my favorite lines from Carl Sagan that the beauty of a living thing is not the matter that go, or not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. And uh, Aristotle speaks to this importance of organization as a description of what the soul is. What what is it that makes something a living soul? Um, in another quote here, he says, "Quote: Hence, soul is the first actuality entelechia of a natural body having in it." the capacity duname of life, and a body which is possessed of organs, organicon, answers to this description, close quote. So I, I think what's important to, to see here is that to be alive, something needs to be organized in a certain way. Um, so a body is it, it putting all the um, chemicals together into structures and organs um, that make it what it is. And this is an intrinsic part of what it means to be a soul. And this happens at multiple levels. So uh, um, organic uh, um, molecules are put together into more complex organic molecules. So we get um, we get uh, proteins, and then we also have enzymes, and those start to work in metabolic processes. And then those work their way further up into physiological processes, and then we have mental processes and all kinds of activities that are taking place in the organism. And Aristotle has another fantastic analogy of this, this importance of the process in uh, the description of the soul, and he uses this analogy of an eye, uh, both the eye and of eyesight. Uh, so he says, quote, For if the eye were an animal, eyesight, opsis, would be its soul, suke, this being the substance, usia, as notion or form, logos, of the eye. The eye is the matter, hule, of eyesight, opseos, and in default or loss of eyesight, it is no longer an eye except equivocally, like an eye in stone or in a picture, close quote. And I think this is just a great analogy because it shows how um, a soul is not just what it is, but also what it does. So an eye, for example, an eye is... Uh, material, but it's also a process. So um, there's a physiological process of the way photons impinge on the retina and then the way uh, those signals are transmitted through the photoreceptors and then into, into the brain and through the nerves. Um, all of that process is eyesight, and that's, that's the comparison that he makes to what the soul is. A soul is activity. It's this actuality that is... Uh, what it, what describes what is uh, uh, an essential activity of a living thing. And uh, he makes this comparison how um, if the eyesight is lost, it's no longer, 
it's no longer an I accept equivocally, right? And so, and so I think of this as kind of a comparison to a corpse as well, um, that a corpse no longer has the activity that makes it a living soul. And he makes this idea quite explicit in another passage where he says, quote, by that which has in it the capacity dunamé of life is meant not the body which has lost its soul, but that which possesses it. Close quote. So basically, a corpse is no longer in soul. It doesn't have the biological processes going um, along with it. So the process is critical to what a what a soul is. So with that set up, let's let's think a little bit about uh, the soul structure. So if we were to have a basic blueprint of the soul, what would that look like? And we know first of all, that it's got to be very, very complex. So um, depending on le what level we're wanting to look at, um, if we're going to look down to the level of elementary particles, well, uh, there are about 10 to the 29th power elementary particles, so that's quarks and electrons, um, in, the bo in, in a body, and those are all in some particular arrangement at any given time. That's an extremely uh, complex structure. And that that complexity is just of the soul at any one moment. But, of course, uh, the arrangement of these uh, 10 to the 29th elementary particles are also continuously changing. Um, and they're not even the same particles. Uh, so, uh, first of all, let's think uh, within the body, with the particles that we have, they're moving around and um, they're, do they're doing things. Um, and then there are new particles that are coming in and the old particles are leaving so there's this uh, constant replacement of particles there there doesn't seem to be any um a, a unitary form um, to all of this. So a, a static snapshot structure is not going to be sufficient. So the structure, it has to be dynamic and we have to incorporate a, uh, a temporal dimension for sure. So the structure is going to have to account for the particles that are entering and leaving the system um, as well as, as the way that they are arranged in the soul as they are there. Uh, the arrangement of these 10 to the 29th elementary particles across time. So if we want this to be a dynamic structure, but still one single structure that we're talking about as a unitary soul, um, one way that we could look at this uh, matter form composite is as a kind of four-dimensional spatio-temporal structure. Um, so I, there's uh, an example and a, a good uh, illustration of this that I read about uh, from uh, Max Tegmark. So Max Tegmark is very well known for his uh, mathematical universe hypothesis. We won't get into the metaphysics of that. We're going to focus for the moment on his uh, idea of a structure of a soul, which I think uh, is kind of uh, useful um, in uh, this uh, this type of conversation. So uh, he actually, in his uh, in his theories, he talks of uh, humans as self-aware substructures, SSAs, uh, that he says substructures because he sees those as substructures nested in larger mathematical structures of being the entire universe or the multiverse. So these substructures um, are what he sees of as comprising um, human beings, and he models these in a very interesting way. Much like Aristotle, he looks at both um, inanimate and animate things. They, they both have structures. It's just that the uh, structures of living things are much more complex and much more interesting. So um, we can think of all objects as uh, spatio-temporal structures, uh, 4D objects that trace out a world line along the temporal dimension. Inanimate objects, uh, their uh, spatio-temporal structures would basically be like tubes. Um, if, if there's no... Uh, change to their internal composition, um, all the particles that make them up are just going to be staying in the same place. Um, they're still uh, they're still moving through time, so there, there's a kind of a, a line in the temporal dimension, but other than that there's no change along the other axes of the spatial dimensions. Animate objects, on the other hand, so living things, souls, I mean, they're, they're going to have crazy complex structures. They're just going to be dizzyingly complex. Um, so uh, they're going to be the, the, their tubes are just going to be uh, like braids. They'll be weaving in and out of each other. Um, so if, if you think about um, all the all the particles that are in your uh, in your body um, as they're evolving through time, they're also evolving through space and crisscrossing each other. And there's a great uh, uh, Max Tegmark has a great way of describing um, this intricate structure. So I'll go ahead and read a passage uh, from from one of his articles. Quote. 
The roughly 10 to the 29th elementary particles, quarks and electrons, that your body is made of form a tube-like shape through space-time. However, the most interesting property of your space-time tube isn't its bulk shape, but its internal structure, which is remarkably complex. Consider, for example, the particles that make up your red blood cells. As your blood circulates through your body to deliver the oxygen you need, each red blood, ce red blood cell traces out its own unique tube shape through space-time, corresponding to a complex itinerary through your arteries, capillaries, and veins with regular returns to your heart and lungs. These space-time tubes of different red blood cells are intertwined to form a braid pattern. Yet the complexity of all this pales in comparison to the patterns of information processing in your brain. Your roughly 100 billion neurons are constantly generating electrical signals, firing, which involves shuffling around billions of trillions of atoms, notably sodium, potassium, and calcium ions. The trajectories of these atoms form an extremely elaborate braid through space-time, whose complex intertwining corresponds to storing and processing information in a way that somehow gives rise to our familiar sensation of self-awareness. There's broad consensus in the scientific community that we still don't understand how this works, so it's fair to say that we humans don't yet fully understand what we are. However, in broad brush, we might say this. You're a pattern in space-time, a mathematical pattern. Specifically, you're a braid in space-time, indeed, one of the most elaborate braids known. At both ends of your space-time braid corresponding to your birth and death, all the threads gradually separate corresponding to all your particles joining, interacting, and finally going their own separate ways. This makes the space-time structure of your entire life resemble a tree. At the bottom, corresponding to early times, is an elaborate system of roots corresponding to the space-time trajectories of many particles, which gradually merge into thicker strands and culminate in a single tube-like trunk corresponding to your current body. At the top, corresponding to late times, the trunk splits into even to ever finer branches corresponding to your particles going their own separate ways once your life is over. In other words, the pattern of life has only a finite extent along the time dimension, with the braid coming apart into frizz at both ends." Close quote. Now, this is certainly beyond anything that Aristotle would have envisioned. He, he didn't have the... Uh, uh, the background in the the modern mathematics and and physics um, that uh, that we have the benefit of now, even though he was probably the most brilliant person who's ever lived. But um, with the uh, this uh, spatiotemporal model, um, I think it's a good way to see the way matter and form work together. Even though uh, even if uh, we have to reduce uh, the dimensions down a little bit, because uh, I can't see in uh, four dimensions, I don't know about you, but um, if we just uh, look at it as two spati spatial dimensions with one temporal dimension, uh, we can kind of see the way um, that matter uh, is put together and moves about and evolves, and it's 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 uh, possible to see how um, there is still a single structure there, even though um, it's an evolving structure from a 4D perspective, it is one um, unitary structure. Now, a, a few considerations to make here. Uh, one thing that I, I notice here is that this structure has continuity. And I think this is important because in the philosophy of mind, one of the uh, questions that uh, needs to be answered is how do we know that a person is the same person uh, from one moment to the next? And uh, um, one answer could be that, well, we're not. We're uh, always changing uh, who we are, and we're not the same person that we were two seconds ago. But that, does, that doesn't seem, um, to the extent that uh, an individual is a kind of uh, uh, construct, a conceptual construct, that doesn't seem very pragmatic. Um, and so um, in, in looking at things this way, even though um, there's evolution through time, um, we can see that there's continuity to this whole thing, and so um, there's still a kind of individual um, object there that uh, has a unity. So individual particles enter and leave the system, and so um, in, in this kind of braid that Tegmark talks about, there are strands that are entering and leaving, but we can still look at it as uh, one structure that endures, at least while it's alive. Um, Another consideration that I think is kind of interesting here is that if we look at things this way, um, ontologically speaking at least, at least in the sense of the way things are, the structure is wholly defined. Uh, even if its uh, boundaries 
are a matter of subjective interest. Like I said, how, how it's a construct and it's pragmatic, um, at least wherever we choose to set the boundaries, it is uh, fully defined. Um, however, um, we want to get to in, into the specifics of all that, you know, we may not be able to specify all the details in a classical sense, but um, if we're talking about uh, quantum properties, um, at that level, um, at least, um, it, is a, uh, is, is it, it is a defined um, ontological structure. And again, it is a very uh, pragmatic and useful structure. Uh, whether uh, this is uh, something that is carving up nature at its joints, uh, a line from Plato there, um, you know, to what extent uh, do many things that actually carve up nature at its joints? Most of the things that we pick out are, are for some type of interest. So I, I don't think that we need to be uh, too uh, concerned about that. Um, an individual person, um, a soul, is probably one of the most... Uh, fundamental um, and necessary uh, uh, constructs that we have. Kant would, Kant, Immanuel Kant would say uh, transcendental. It's uh, basically uh, something that we need uh, to be able to think about um, anything else um, in our subjective experience. Still, as much as I like that model, um, I don't see in 4D. No one sees in 4D. Um, we only see um, the three spatial dimensions um, at any one time. So if we wanted to reduce this model uh, to something uh, of what we more actually experience, um, we're going to lose um, some of that uh, specificity. So this may be more practical because it's, it's um, applicable to the world as we see it, uh, but it's necessarily going to be less complete and precise. So how do we manage that imprecision in the reduced model? And to explain a little bit more what I mean by a reduced model. So with the 4D model, it's, um, it's easy to see how uh, the soul, the structure of the soul is just one thing. But if we take away one dimension, then we're back to a situation where we have a structure that's changing. And so we're left with this problem of how do we see the unity um, in that structure in just three dimensions, since it's going to be different uh, from one time to the next. And thinking about what we're doing here when we perform that reduction, if uh, we think about the 4D structure, um, this braid of, of all the world lines traced by this uh, 10 to the 29th particles uh, that at any one moment are coming in and out of our body and, and tracing out the, the 4D structure of our body, um, we're taking, uh, in the reduced a form, we're taking a slice out of that. We're taking a 3D slice out of that and looking at it, and maybe we're taking multiple slices at a time and, and analyzing them. The ontology of the 4D structure is exactly defined, at least in some sense. Um, at the reduced dimension, when we're taking just these 3D slices out of the 4D structure, then it becomes an epistemological problem. Um, how do we know, how, do, how can we infer anything about the whole 4D structure from these uh, three-dimensional slices. So uh, to uh, put the epistemological problem there in more concrete terms, um, so this, uh, this four-dimensional soul structure is a person, right? So um, if we're taking these three-dimensional slices basically at uh, different times, we could say one slice is at T uh, time t1, another slice is at time t2, and so it's the same person, but uh, when we look at this person at different times, there's going to be difference. If, if it's uh, over uh, many years, over many decades even, um, uh, the person's going to look quite a bit different because the person will have aged. So uh, there's not an identity between these three-dimensional slices. Um, they look different uh, from this perspective perspective, even though from the 4D perspective, they're parts of the same structure, but that's not um, completely easy to see at um, the three-dimensional level. Nevertheless, there, there must be some indications that we can draw from um, so that we so that we can use this. So the complete structure, the 4D structure, isn't something that's accessible uh, to us. We can't see the whole end from the beginning of a, of a person's life um, all at once, um, and, and we certainly can't see the future. Um, but we can look for accessible indication of the, the structure's continuity. And one way that I like to think of this is to take a design stance. Um, so these are, these are some conceptual tools, and I'm, I'm drawing that idea of a design stance from Daniel Dennett. Um, but if we think of the structure as something that we built um, from a 
level of reduced dimension where we don't have complete and exact knowledge, um, how could we design in um, that in precision? So uh, one concept uh, from a design stance that I, that I could apply is tolerance. So in engineered structures, um, every th just like uh, going, going to uh, the Aristotelian uh, view of this, every object is a matter form complex. Um, and so engineered structures also have a matter and a form that's uh, a form, uh, formal element to them. Um, and we don't require absolute exactness in the formal ele element elements of an engineered structure. It, it's just not possible. Um, we don't get down to the level of uh, subatomic particles in our designs. That would just be crazy. Um, so we assign tolerances, okay? We look at what the form, fit, and function of the piece is and say, okay, what, what variance is um, um, going to be allowed where it performs exactly the same for all practical purposes? Even if, even if the form does have this variance, for the form, fit, and function of the part, it doesn't matter. So there's a window of acceptable variance in which the formal element of the structure is considered identical for practical purposes. So let's take on this design stance for a living soul and imagine that we've designed a person. Um, so the easiest way to think of it approach is just think a person from one microsecond to the next. Um, the difference the difference at uh, a molecular, or well, the difference at a macroscopic level rather is going to be imperceptible. Um, we have no problem identifying that a person from one microsecond to the next is the, is the same person, or really from day to day, right? Um, there are differences. We understand that there are differences. Somebody may change their hairstyle, um, but those are all considered within the tolerance of, of, of our concepts of what would be the same individual. And that gets a little, that tolerance has to widen a little bit over time so that, uh, you know, if we haven't seen a person within decades, um, it, there's going to be a greater variance that we allow for. But still, um, even though the tolerance is wider, there's um, more, uh, there's more similarity um, so that we can still see that this isn't some other person, um, um, that uh, this, this still is the same person even over time. Another example that's helpful for me from technology and engineering is uh, perceptual coding. Uh, so in perceptual coding, um, information is encoded only to the, to the degree that is necessary um, to be indistinguishable, indistinguishable to perception. And so the uh, best example I know of is the MP3 uh, file, the sound file, audio file. Uh, so in MP3 compression, um, a lot of information is removed from the file, and that's why MP3s are able to be manageable file sizes. So uh, the way MP3, MP3 compression works is by reducing the accuracy of certain components of sound that are beyond our abilities to distinguish anyway. And so there's a psycho, psychoacoustic analysis um, that is uh, used to see, okay, what what wouldn't make a difference anyway? So there's masking of sounds. Um, if um, one sound uh, covers up other sounds that uh, we wouldn't hear anyway, that information can be removed. And so um, that uh, that's another um, way that we could see if if the difference is not going to be something that pragmatically affects our ability to see that uh, the continuity of the individual that or the identity of the individual across time um, then then that's okay we can we can still um, we can still see uh, the indication of the uh, objective uh, unity of the four-dimensional structure e even if we can't access it directly um, and then uh, I, just another example of this that, that I think is interesting. So just music itself, um, musical compositions are highly variable in their, uh, in their performances. So um, if we think of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, what is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? And, and how can we say, okay, yes, this is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It can be recorded on many different media, and it's going to be performed a little bit differently every time. Um, every recording is going to be a little bit different. Um, it can be a live performance. It can be 
on a, a gramophone. It could be on a, a a vinyl record, on a CD, on an uh, an MP3 player, like an iPod. Um, all of these are different, but uh, we recognize as long as they match the basic uh, the basic composition, um, which um, is the fi- the uh, the composition that Beethoven put down on paper, um, the way that that's actually brought about um, through performance and recorded and encoded, um, that variation doesn't matter, right? We can see the uh, the underlying unity um, and identity um, of the musical composition still. So those are some ways of thinking about and modeling the soul. But I want to address um, an issue that I think is important, and that is that the soul may seem like um, an antiquated notion. Uh, so that there's uh, some kind of spookiness to the soul. Um, so it seems like a, this this obsolete relic from pre-modern times, and that dressing it up in uh, uh, modern-sounding language is, is kind of just changing it to something else. So it, what you know, all the stuff that I've described with the spatiotemporal structures and 4D uh, models, it, it sounds quite different. It doesn't sound so like uh, as popularly popularly understood. Uh, but uh, from from what I've read historically, I, I think this is arguably consistent with thought of the most reflective minds in classical, classical and medieval thought on the subject. So um, uh, Aristotle uh, is a classical thinker, um, and his talk of soul, I think, uh, of course, he didn't, uh, he didn't have the, the benefit of modern physics, but other than that, uh, philosophically speaking, um, it sounds like something that could have been written yesterday. Um, he's, he's a very sounding uh, uh, philosophical thinker, and I definitely encourage reading his stuff. It's, 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 it's fantastic. Um, and also, um, in medieval thought, um, uh, contrary to the thought of uh, the Dark Ages, uh, uh, medieval times as uh, these uh, uh, days when uh, nobody had any uh, uh, intellectual aspirations. Um, there was a lot of great thinking uh, going on um, that I think uh, is uh, consistent with these these lines as well, and, and including, uh, well, uh, religious thinkers, uh, as uh, many of them were uh, uh, philosophers and theologians at the time. So the, the soul doesn't have to be something spooky or uh, obscurantist. Now, um, this kind of, uh, it, it, it seems like it's a, it's a demystification, right? It, if it sounds, um, in, in the language uh, that we're talking about here, it doesn't sound as uh, mis- mystif- mystifying or mystical as uh, we would usually think of. Uh, so it doesn't sound very soul-like. So, um, you know, we th- often associate things that seem mysterious with that mysterious quality. The mysteriousness of it seems like something that's essential to it. And then if we talk about it in a different way, uh, and we analyze it a little bit and uh, refer to it in different language uh, and see it as less mysterious, it may seem like something else. It might seem less like itself, um, since it's uh, lost this uh, attribute that may have seemed essential to it. So, does that mean that the concept has been reduced to something else? Has it been eliminated uh, altogether? Um, so I, I think of like the man uh, behind the Iron Curtain with the Great Wizard of Oz, right? We have this uh, uh, conception of something like the soul as the Great Wizard of Oz, and then we find, oh, it's just the man behind the Iron Curtain. Well, I don't really like that. I, I don't think that's the case because uh, the man in the Iron Curtain is a disappointment where I still think that the... Uh, um, uh, Philosophical analysis of the soul, um, uh, as as discussed here, is is quite fascinating, and uh, and uh, I hope not uh, disappointing. It's certainly not disappointing to me. Uh, the letdown of like like the man in the iron curtain in the Wizard of Oz. Um, now, sometimes that does happen, right? Uh, if something is reduced uh, to something else, and it, it's nothing but this other thing, that, that can happen. But it's not necessary. It doesn't have to be the case. Um, and I, I think a lot of times after philosophical reflection, um, the notions as popular as popularly understood, and soul is certainly one of those, um, undergo some transformation. Um, but I would want to say that that is just a uh, refinement of the view um, and getting closer to, I guess, a more a more satisfactory um, view that that's more complete. Um, it's, it's not the uh, elimination 
of uh, the concept altogether. I still think that the concept of soul is useful, and it's not one that I want to dispense with, um, because I do think that it includes more than we are used to thinking of in a more uh, uh, parsimonious or abstemious uh, um, kind of materialism. And I think that the Aristotelian view and, and uh, adds something to our concept, and uh, and it's useful to use that term still because it is the term that has been a common a common thread uh, throughout the history. So it wouldn't make sense or be very practical to just drop the term and replace it with something else. On that note of the ongoing conversation, uh, the intellectual conversation around soul and suke, um, interestingly enough, a lot of this has been. Uh, from uh, religious sources, so Jewish and Christian intellectual uh, theologians slash philosophers, uh, who definitely uh, uh, were in conversation uh, with the Hellenistic uh, tradition and uh, Aristotle, um, but uh, also carried this along in their own religious traditions. So I guess I'm doing a little bit of apologetic uh, for that as well, um, that uh, many of these religious thinkers were quite sophisticated and we owe a debt to them uh, for uh, providing us many of the uh, intellectual resources uh, that we still use today. And I think that the body plays a much more important role in this theology than we are often used to thinking of. Um, that in, in a way, it's it's a little bit more materialist than we're used to thinking of, because um, in, in the popular notions, we might think of soul as something that's uh, non-bodily or against the body, um, that uh, it's kind of, uh, the body's a uh, dispensable uh, component uh, of that, or a dispensable add-on to it. Uh, but really, um, if, uh, if we think about the logic of Christian theology, the body is very important, right? Um, so this is a reason that uh, immortality, the promise of eternal life, is expressed in terms not of a, a non-bodily afterlife, of a disembodied afterlife. It, no, it's expressed in terms of resurrection. Uh, so what is resurrection? Resurrection is the restoration of the body. Uh, that is the restoration of life, that... Uh, we are brought back to life by being embodied again. And that's why resurrection is so crucial. And, and so uh, this, uh, this mission of Christ uh, to bring about resurrection is so central. So um, in, just in, in the logic of the Christian theology itself, this idea of, of body, uh, body and soul unity, that, uh, that the soul is the form of the body, is... Uh, is very compatible, and uh, and Christian theologians notice this. So, um, in in the earliest days, certainly in in early Christianity, but one of the most noteworthy examples, uh, particularly with Aristotle, since we've been talking about Aristotle, is uh, in uh, is later in in uh, uh, the Middle Ages in uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas, his dates are twelve twenty five to twelve seventy four. And he was a key figure in what's called the medieval synthesis. Uh, and the medieval synthesis is a synthesis of Christian ideas with, uh, with uh, ancient Greek philosophy. So Aristotle in particular. Aristotle was, was the man in, in these days that uh, people were uh, reading his work again and uh, figuring out ways to apply it to Christian theology. And, and uh, Thomas Aquinas picked up many of the ideas uh, in regards to soul, among other things, but uh, especially in regards to soul, um, and uh, use them in the service of a, uh, a rational, developed, uh, very intellectualized Christian theology. And uh, this medieval th synthesis, I would consider one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest intellectual achievements in human history. And this continues in the present day in Christian thought. I, I like to keep up on what is uh, being discussed um, in. Uh, the uh, Christian intellectual scene and the Christian philosophical scene. Um, so uh, one uh, one project that I've paid attention to is uh, the work of Patrick Lee and Robert P. George on body-self dualism, uh, particularly the refutation of that or arguing against it in Christian theology that uh, uh, body soul body self dualism rather it doesn't have a place in Christian theology, but uh, rather uh, the soul is a unity. 
Uh, so in uh, they have a book uh, called Body Self-Dualism in Contemporary Ethics and Politics, and they continue in this tradition of Aristotle's view of the soul as a matter-form complex, unity rather than duality. So a couple quotes from them, uh, they, they say in their book, we argue that human beings are physical, animal organisms, albeit essentially rational and free. And uh, another line from them, uh, this is indeed, there is indeed a third possibility a via media between the extremes of physicalism and substance dualism. As a matter of historical fact, Thomas Aquinas presented a third alternative. So they're, they're uh, relying on this uh, thought from Thomas Aquinas and vicariously um, through Aristotle. So here's, here's a quote uh, describing their position. Quote, Like other organisms, the human being has a matter-form composition. The various cells, tissues, organs, and so on must be prioritized or unified so as to make up one being. The ultimate principle of unity cannot be a material organ, since this would only give rise to aggregate, to an aggregate of this organ with other bodies, and so the unity of this organ with others would remain unexplained. But it must be a form or order determining the components to be one substantial entity in living being. This form or principle of unity can be referred to as a soul, since the soul is, philosophically, defined as the first principle of life in an organized body. And you can see there they're referring back to Aristotle. Um, quote, the soul is the formal source, as opposed to the efficient cause, of the living operations of a living being. Such operations as growth, nourishment, perception, and in human being, understanding and willing. The efficient cause of these operations, in the sense of the subject that performs these operations, is the living organism as a whole. Thus the human being is not a soul using or inhabiting a body, but a composite of soul and body, if by body one refers to the material components in the makeup of a human being, close quote. And I would just add as a comment on this, you know, orthodoxy is kind of a matter, I suppose, of, of who you ask, but um, I, would, I would say that uh, in a mainstream view, this is the orthodox position theologically, that uh, this isn't some uh, type of uh, modern accommodation, uh, that this is the uh, orthodox Christian position of this uh, uh, essentially embodied uh, human soul. So I'll wrap up this uh, uh, part two episode on the soul for now. Um, I don't know if I'll do a part three. If I do a part three, it might be getting into more of this uh, religious theological history, um, particularly in Judaism um, or uh, ancient Israelite religion in the Old Testament. There's some very interesting um, stuff in relation to the body on that and uh, maybe in the Christian fathers and a little bit more Aquinas. Um, I'll, I'll have to do some reading on on that as well to prepare. But um, uh, if I if I do a, a part three, it'll probably be on that. Uh, but uh, uh, for part two, I will wrap it up for there uh, for now and just say thanks again for listening.